we will, uh, then we will get underway. Lord, thank you that we can gather again uh, tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have of uh, growing in our understanding. And Lord, of course, the most important thing is to grow in our understanding of your word, uh, to grow in our faith in Jesus Christ, uh, to become stronger in our witness and our testimony. That, Lord, far and away is the most important thing. But Lord, along the way, as we learn about your people, the history of your church, even our own denomination, we call ourselves a Lutheran church. So Lord, to understand more about what our heritage is, what our background is, uh, the work that you did in bringing about a great movement of reformation and reform, Lord, how important those things are as well. So Lord, blessings uh, now as we look into our uh, material this night, we pray in Jesus' name. I just ended, I left the, the last slide from last week. We ended talking about Luther and his Bible translation, where when he was uh, in the Wartburg Castle, remember after the Diet of Worms, where he made his great stand for Christ, uh, you know, my conscience is captive to the word of God. I, can, I will not recant anything. It's not safe or right to go against conscience. Here I stand, God help me, amen. That tremendous stand that he made. Well, you remember the Diet of Worms then passed the death sentence on him. And that anybody uh, was, everybody was called upon to apprehend him at the first possible opportunity and to turn him over to the imperial authorities so that he could be tried for his heresy and so he could be put to death. So you remember when Luther left Worms, his friends kidnapped him. They were afraid to even let him make the journey all the way back to his hometown. And so he was kidnapped as evening was falling. It was his friend, the prince, the elector, Frederick the Wise, who ordered a band of special operations knights to, to stop the vehicle that he was riding in to say, we want this heretic Luther, nobody else. And they grabbed him, bound him, gagged him, threw him on a horse, and then when they got away, it's like, hey, guess what? This is all a setup, don't be afraid. And so took him to the Wartburg Castle where he grew out his hair, grew out his beard, learned how to be a knight. Uh, he was called Knight George. Everybody in the castle for a while thought, oh, we got a new knight who's here in the castle. You know, wonder where he came from. Uh, while he was there, Luther translated the New Testament into German in 11 weeks. And we talked about just uh, then later the Old Testament and, and all of that. Well, while Luther is um, in the castle in Wartburg, a group of radicals invades uh, the town of Wittenberg. And uh, these radicals are called, named after the town they came from, the Zwickau Prophets. Uh, they were from a little town called Zwickau, which today is on the German-Czech uh, border. And, uh, and, and they were radicals. They believed that Luther and his Reformation didn't go anywhere far enough. And so they come into Wittenberg. We have the real truth. We have the real way the church should look. And so the, the one thing that marked these Zwickau prophets, they were like modern-day charismatics. Basically, we have visions and dreams, and that is our authority. It's not that we set aside the scriptures. No, 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 we believe the Bible too. But God said to me, God told me, that kind of thing. And so for them, their final authority in theological matters was direct revelation from the Holy Spirit, as our modern charismatic friends sometimes are today, dreams and visions. So they began proclaiming that. Here's what God told us. Here's what the Holy Spirit told us we need to do here in town, that sort of thing. And so this radicalism begins to, uh, begins to upset the whole town. Some of the other things that were upsetting, uh, they opposed uh, infant baptism, believed that should be immediately abolished. Uh, they predicted that the end of days was here. There was going to be that uh, final apocalypse. And there was going to be the introduction by the Lord Jesus when he returns of a democratic millennium. Very interesting. Um, they, they, they sought a believer's church rather than a state church. Those kinds of things. Anyway, so, so their coming to Wittenberg created a, a great deal of unrest in the city, and nobody seemed to know what to do. Even uh, Luther's close associate, Philip Melanchthon, wasn't quite sure how to handle these, uh, handle these radicals. And so the town council held a meeting, and they had by that time discovered that Luther was hiding out in the Wartburg Castle. And so they sent a message pleading with him to come out of hiding. You need to come to Wittenberg. The whole town is in uproar. The Reformation, which you've uh, begun, is in danger of becoming just uh, radical in every which way. And so Luther comes out of, of hiding in the Wartburg Castle, and he comes back to Wittenberg in, in March of uh, 1522. He comes back on a Thursday, 
And on that Sunday, he preaches a series of eight sermons from Sunday to Sunday. And his sermons are directed against these Zwickau prophets. Um, they're, all, they're, they're directed in general. This is uh, the word Luther liked to use for them and similar folks. He called them the schwärmer, the fanatics. That was his term. And so there's a series of eight sermons directed against the schwärmer, directed against the fanatics. And this series of eight sermons that, that Luther preached, a, a couple of main points in these sermons is, is to understand what Christian freedom is and to understand about Christian love from a New Testament standpoint. And what Luther argues in these sermons is what some of you are doing in Wittenberg, you are exchanging one tyranny for another. You're exchanging the tyranny of the Pope and the church and the hierarchy, that indeed is a tyranny, but you're exchanging it for the tyranny of radicalism, which is just as bad. Um, if you know anything about secular history, you think of the French Revolution, end of the 1700s. King Louis XVI, why, he's a tyrant, need to overthrow him. So, of course, you know what happened. The revolutionaries got hold of Louis XVI, Marie Antoinette beheaded them. Well, now things will be so much better, will they not? You read about the French Revolution, the radicals that got hold of Paris. I mean, it was the reign of terror. They exchanged one tyranny for a worse one. And you think about today, the hard left in our country. There, there is no tyranny worse than the hard left. Political correctness. I mean, you, you think about what the radical hard left in our country is today. If they ever got in control, talk about tyranny. And, and so Luther warns against the tyranny of, of radicalism. And so he says, when it comes to all these issues in the church, you need to show love to the weak. So Luther would say, for example, let's say in our church, we have over on the wall here a statue of, let's say, St. Philip. Well, we shouldn't have a statue in the church. Got to take that thing out. Luther says, whoa, 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 wait a minute. There are some people who've had that there all their whole lives. It's not really a matter of right and wrong, like a moral principle. Leave it alone. Let the word do its work. In due time, it'll disappear. Um, have love for weaker brethren is, is what Luther argues in these sermons. Uh, if, if it's not a matter of right and wrong, if it's not a moral principle, be patient about it, and you have no right to compel another Christian in matters that are left free. And so Luther says, if there are abuses, they need to be abolished, but you don't have rabble-rousers in the street deciding how to abolish them. They need to be abolished in an orderly manner and by proper authorities. So he preaches a series of eight sermons. That pretty much is, is the theme of each of them. And, and he manages to kind of uh, uh, quell the, the radicalism uh, in, in the city. Let me just give you an excerpt from, uh, from one of them. Let me see if I can fix my microphone a little bit here. Uh, he, here's, I, I just arbitrarily uh, picked a paragraph out of one of his eight sermons. This is from Sermon 2, preached on, on Monday, March 10th. And I want you to notice what Luther says about the word. He writes this, or he says this in this sermon. In short, I will preach it, namely the word. Teach it, write it, but I will constrain no man by force. For faith must come freely without compulsion. Take myself as, as an example. I opposed indulgences and all the papists, but never with force. I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's word, otherwise I did nothing. And while I slept, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, an allusion to Mark 4, where the farmer plants the seed, and while he sleeps, the seed grows, he knows not how. And while I slept, or drank Wittenberg beer with my friends, the word so greatly weakened the papacy that no prince or emperor ever inflicted such losses upon it. I did nothing. The word did everything. Had I desired to foment trouble, I could have brought great bloodshed upon Germany. Indeed, I could have started such a game that even the emperor would not have been safe. But what would it have been? Mere fool's play. I did nothing. I let the word do its work. What do you suppose is Satan's thought when one tries to do the thing by kicking up a row? He sits back in hell and thinks, oh, what a fine game the, the poor fools are up to now. But when we spread the word alone and let it alone do the work, that distresses him, for it is almighty and takes captive the hearts. And then that last little line which kind of fades out on the bottom of the screen. And when the hearts are captured, the work will fall by itself. 
power. So that was the theme of these eight sermons by Martin Luther. Well, the prophets there, so Luther shows up back in town. The Zwickau prophets are there. There were three of them, by the way. And they confronted Luther and they said, our message from the Lord is superior to what you're preaching and teaching because the Spirit talks to us. He reveals things to us. We have visions, we have dreams. You know, God says this, the Spirit says that. And so Luther says to them, all right, you claim to be a prophet. Authenticate the fact that you're prophets. Perform a miracle, perform a sign. Well, they wouldn't do it. And uh, Luther, and they kept saying to Luther, the Spirit this, the Spirit that. And Luther said to them, I slap your spirit on the snout. And when they realized Luther was a horrible heretic who couldn't be moved, they denounced him in the name of the Lord, and they left Wittenberg. And so there was an attempt uh, with these radicals to to take the the Reformation in a very different direction. Well, let me jump ahead a couple of years. 1524, 1525, there was a, a deadly, horrifying peasants' war in Germany. And of course, Luther is blamed for it, as you can imagine. The the peasants heard what Luther had to say um, about freedom. There's freedom in Christ. There is liberty in Christ. We're not in bondage anymore to sin and death and hell. And these peasants start thinking, this is great. If we're not in bondage to sin, death, hell, darkness, all these things, why should we be in economic bondage? Why should we be in political bondage? Why does this freedom and this liberty business stop just with things in church? There should be freedom and liberty all across society. And so there was a revolution, a revolt, uprisings that began in the summer of 1524. And uh, by the spring of 1525, all of Germany was was affected by peasant uprisings uh, everywhere. The peasants put together a, a little document called the Twelve Articles in which they said, here is what we would like to see. It was a very moderate kind of document. And what they said, we're interested in peace. We don't want violence. We're interested in love among all peoples. They advocated patience and unity and all of these things, while at the same time saying we should have rights and we should have liberties. Well, all of this begins to unfold, and Luther writes a series of three tracts Uh, dealing with this whole peasants' revolt. And and I'm not going to take the time, as as I might otherwise, to go through exactly what he wrote in in each of these three. But basically, the first one is, read these 12 articles and says, if you guys mean what you say, and and I hope you do, um, be aware that God is at work through all the events of history. Um, Rebellion against God is rebellion against his established order. But if what you say in these articles is so... Um, Luther was not opposed to some of the things they were speaking of, some of the rights that they were seeking, some of the freedoms that they had an interest in. Well, this peasants' revolt uh, became more and more violent. And and Luther realized that these peasants were actually, many of them, revolutionaries and were committing all kinds of atrocities, murders and rapes and burning houses down and destroying crops and all of these things. And he realized that these peasants would stop at nothing other than the complete overthrow of all society, church, government, and everything. And Luther also had heard that he was being quoted uh, favorably by them. Well, Luther says this. uh, They were quoting him in support of their violence and their lawlessness. So he wrote a second pamphlet, which if you ever want to read harsh things that Luther wrote, this is one of them. Against the murderous and plundering bands among the peasants. And I'm not going to outline what he says in this tract. Let me just read one paragraph so you get a sense of of the harsh, violent, biting language that Luther used in this second pamphlet. He says this, If a peasant is in open rebellion, then he is outside the law of God. For rebellion is not simply murder, but it is like a great fire which attacks and lays waste a whole land. Thus, rebellion brings with it a land full of murders and bloodshed, making widows and orphans and turns everything upside down like a great disaster. Therefore, let everyone who can smite, slay, and stab secretly or openly. I mean, every peasant you can find. Remembering that nothing can be more poisonous, hurtful, or devilish than a rebel. It is just as when one must kill a mad dog. 
If you don't strike him, he will strike you and the whole land with you. Kill every peasant you find in this pamphlet. Well, when this tract comes out, the tide had already turned and the government was winning. And the government was slaughtering peasants left and right. And so Luther's friend said to him, you need to come out with another statement. In fact, m- many of his friends said, you've got to retract this thing right here, which you wouldn't do, by the way. So he writes a third pamphlet called A Letter on the Harsh Booklet Against the Peasants. And what he says in there is all the devils of hell which entered into the peasants so that they raped and burned and murdered and all that, instead of going back to hell where they belong, now they've entered the government officials, the soldiers, and now they're the ones filled with demons doing all these horrifying things. Uh, atrocities. Uh, it, so this one is a little more conciliatory, um, but he said to a friend who said, you need to retract this one right here. Here's what Luther said. Tell me, dear friend, what kind of excuse is it when someone strangles your father and mother, rapes your wife and your child, burns your house, steals your money and goods, and says afterwards he had to do it? He was forced to such an action. Luther said, no, I'm not retracting. Although he tried to tone it down. What what happened was, as a result of this, the peasants are like, Luther is not our friend. We thought he was one of us. And I guess he's not. I guess he's in bed with the powers that be. I guess he's in cahoots with the government, with the way the system works. And so there were a number of peasants who turned from Lutheranism saying, we thought Luther was our friend, our advocate. And I guess he's not. So this turned... A number of the peasants in Germany against uh, the Lutheran uh, movement. Well, in the years following 1521, and I have more on here. This was part of my presentation down in the Twin Cities, which I'm not going to uh, go through for the sake of time. But in 1521, this is when Luther was at the Diet of Worms, where he made his famous stand, which I referenced just several minutes ago. Every diet that was held after that, had to in some way deal with this Lutheran question. Because Luther's put under the death sentence, Lutheranism isn't to be taught, you're not to have any of Luther's works, there's to be no reform, all of these things. But here's the problem. After this edict was passed, Charles V, who was the emperor, I've mentioned his name several times, if you remember the map that I showed you, Charles V ruled all of Central Europe, the so-called Holy Roman Empire, which was Germany and parts of France and Italy and Switzerland and Austria and Poland. I mean, it's this huge area of Central Europe. He was emperor over all of that. And as you know, he was the monarch of Spain, the king of Spain. He controlled all of the New World from the southwestern United States to the tip of Argentina. That was his empire. And talk about having problems. I mean, you you have an empire that is that massive. And so there was all kinds of things going on. And so even though Charles wanted to move against the Lutherans, he had so many issues because the Turks would come at, you know, his empire from through Eastern Europe. Got to stand against the Turks. Uh, The Pope in Italy, Charles's territory surrounded the Pope's territory, and they would come to military conflict sometimes. So he was caught up with that. Francis I, the king of France, was his bitterest enemy because Francis is surrounded by Charles on each side and there were many wars and conflicts. And so Charles wants to stamp out the Lutherans, but he can't do it because he's got the whole new world to run. He's king of Spain. He's king over all of Central Europe. He's got all kinds of things he has to deal with. And so in the providence of God, the Lord kept Charles V so busy with stuff he didn't have time to deal with the Lutherans until it was too late. And so Frederick postponed, so this, this edict was passed. Luther is to be arrested, Lutheranism is to be stamped out, but he needs military help. France is coming against him, and if he alienates the Lutheran princes, they're not going to send troops, they're not going to raise tax revenue, and so being a, a, a skilled politician, He decides, you know what, this Edict of Worms where we're going to stamp out Lutheranism, let's just kind of put it on hold for a little bit. And so in 1526, I'm not going to go through all these various diets and what was decided, but this one right here, 1526, the diet meeting in the German city of Speyer. And Charles in 1526 was in a pretty difficult spot 
many political pressures from many different directions. He needed the support of every one of the states of Central Europe. He needed the support of Lutheran princes. And so what this diet in 1526 at Speyer, what they decided was, and I'm going to quote from their, from their minutes, that every estate, every province within the Holy Roman Empire, here's the quotation, will with its subjects act, live, and govern in matters touching the worm's edict in a way each can justify before God and his imperial majesty. So you can, you can interpret this how you want, pretty much is what it says. As long as you have a clear conscience before God and you can justify what you're doing someday before the emperor. And the principle that was established in 1526, here's the little Latin phrase that was used. Cuius regio eius religio, which literally means whose realm his religion. So what that means is, so let's say I'm the duke of whatever province. It's my realm. And I decide I'm going to be Lutheran. Everybody's going to be Lutheran in my province or else. They'll be persecuted or maybe they need to move. So the Diet of Spire said, whoever's realm it is, whatever province it is, whoever the ruler is, whatever his religion is, that's your religion. Whose realm? His religion. And that was the principle set up in 1526. So what this did was, it gave the Lutheran rulers in Central Europe the signal to proceed with reforms right and left, which they did. And it saw in the years that followed between 1526 and we're going to come in a moment to 1529. In these three years, uh, virtually a, a Lutheran state church was established across much of Germany. Um, 1529, most of all, all of northern Germany was Lutheran. Many of the cities in the southern part of Germany had become Lutheran. Uh, the Swiss cities had joined the, the Swiss Reformation under a man by the name of Zwingli. We'll come to him in several minutes. And, and so it seemed like all of Central Europe what was turning in a Lutheran direction. Well, in, in 1529, the German parliament, if you will, the Diet, meets again in the same city, the city of Speyer. They admit there in 1526, now they meet in 1529. Uh, here's a picture of, of, the, of the Speyer Cathedral. I obviously didn't take that one. I didn't get up in a plane to take that one. But this is, this is a magnificent building. It's this massive Romanesque uh, cathedral there in, in the city of, of Speyer. And so, and so the, the German parliament meets in 1529 uh, in the same city, in the city of Speyer. And by this time, Charles is in a much more, uh, in a much more uh, enviable position. He's strong. Uh, he doesn't have any military foes coming against him. Now's the time to move against the Lutherans. You had the edict in 1521. You kind of made some compromises in 1526 to let everybody do what he wants to do but that was just because i had to do it now it's 1529 and now it's time to enforce this thing now it's time to stamp out lutheranism once and for all and so the diet gathers in, in 1529 and there's two issues on the parliamentary agenda two big ones one is there's war against the Turks that needs to be initiated because the Turks, as they're meeting in 1529, the Turks have already taken eastern, southeastern Europe. The, the Muslim forces have swept up through the Balkans. They've taken what today would be um, like a Serbia, Bulgaria, Greece, Macedonia. All of those are under their authority. And, and the great Suleiman the Magnificent, as he was called, as he's called in history, is, is on the march. And he's approaching Hungary. Um, and it's not too long after this diet meets that he takes the city of, of Buda, which today, of course, you have Budapest, which is twin cities, by the way, like Minneapolis, St. Paul. Buda's on one side of the river, Pest is on the other, and it's just combined today into Budapest. But he comes to the outskirts of Budapest. By the end of the year, he's actually outside the gates of Vienna, Austria, besieging the city of Vienna. That's how far Islam pushed in, in 1529. So, so they're beginning their march across South eastern europe they're in the balkans and so charles says we've got to gather some forces we need to get our troops together we need to fight against this uh, menace of islam and we also need to deal with this lutheran question and we need to reverse this policy of tolerance and all be back in the one true church and so the, the diet of spire meets and the lutheran uh, representatives at the diet 
said, we're not going to talk about the Turkish issue and raising troops to fight the Muslims until we talk about the religious one. Well, Charles wanted to do it, of course, the other way around. But what the decision was at this Diet of Schweir in 1529, the second of the two, was that the idea of the prince being responsible for your religion, that's out the window now. We're revoking that. There is only one religion, there is one, only one true faith, and that is the Roman Catholic faith with the Pope as the head. And the Edict of Worms of 1521, which directs itself against Luther and Lutheranism, it is to be enforced immediately uh, without any further delay. That was the decision. Because again, in this parliament, by the way, you got majority Catholic delegates because there's still more Catholic states than there are Lutheran ones. Um, it's to be enforced immediately, this Edict of, of Worms against Lutheranism. And um, in the meantime, the, the Diet recognized there's a couple strong Lutheran lands where you're not going to uproot Lutheranism that easily. So it's like, okay, for now, uh, we'll allow you to stay intact, but be aware we're going to be abolishing this Lutheran heresy as soon as we can. But the idea was, in the meantime, if you are a Lutheran ruler, you need to allow Catholics freedom of religion, freedom of worship. However, if you're a Lutheran living in a Catholic territory, there's no such thing that's going to be coming your way. And so this is what the Diet of Speyer came, came to the conclusion. And the Lutherans, I'm going to quote from, from what they wrote, they said, Christ is again in the hands of Caiaphas and Pilate, is the way they put it. And, and so there they are. So what do you do? Well, on the 25th of April, 25th of April, 1529, some of the Lutheran delegates who were there at that meeting put together a document where they protested the setting aside of what had been done in 1526, where you let each prince decide the religion of the people under him. And so they put together, they, 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 they put together a formal protest document. Hence, they were called, therefore, Protestants. Or, as we have done today, joined the word Protestants. So it is out of this meeting in 1529 that those who stood against the reversal of everything the Reformation had accomplished all these years, those who protested that decision were called Protestants, and that's how the term Protestant has come into, uh, into our language. That They took as their motto uh, this phrase, the word of God abides forever. And they said, we will not countenance anything contrary to the word. They understood that if the decisions of 1526 were reversed, the whole Reformation was in jeopardy and, and could be swept away. Well, in the midst of all of this, Martin Luther, to rally the troops, as it were, writes his great battle hymn of the Reformation, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. It's for the Diet of Speyer that he wrote it. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. And as that last stanza says, you know, let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, his kingdom is forever. So at this great protest, when the Reformation was hanging in the balance, Luther wrote that great battle hymn of the Reformation, a mighty fortress is our God. So that was the decision made at, um, at Speyer. So, okay, now what do you do? What do you do? One of the Lutheran political leaders had an idea. And uh, I showed a picture of, of him on that great Reformation monument the first night that we met. There were a couple political leaders on the monument. One of them, a man by the name of Philip of Hesse, probably the strongest of the Lutheran political leaders. And so he said, you know what, with, the, with 1529, with this uh, decision of the Diet of Speyer, we need to form a military alliance because the Catholics are coming for us. So we need to form a military alliance that we can defend ourselves, protect our territory, protect our faith, protect our beliefs. And so he wanted to unite all the Protestants in Central Europe in one entity. The problem is the Protestants had differing theologies. And everybody on each side said, we're not going to be in an alliance unless we're in perfect doctrinal agreement. Otherwise, no go. And so Philip, however, decided he was going to make a shot at it. By the way, let me just show you one more picture here real quickly. This is on the Reformation statue in, in, in Worms. I showed this uh, the, first, uh, the first night. This a woman here on the statue represents the Diet of Speyer, and you notice her hand raised in protest, um, the symbolism of, of the sculptor. All right, so, so Philip invites 
a meeting of Protestant theologians to his castle. There it is uh, in, in Marburg. It's called the Marburg Colloquy, a colloquy, a, a discussion. Philip of Hesse. So it's still 1529, and the meeting is from October 1 to October 4th. And the two main theologians that are at this meeting is uh, Martin Luther and other faculty from Wittenberg and so on. And the other uh, major theologian there is a man by the name of Zwingli, Ulrich Zwingli, who had begun Protestant reform work in the city of Zurich, Switzerland. And uh, Luther and Zwingli had written against each other on various points of doctrine, particularly with regard to the Lord's Supper. They were in sharp disagreement over that doctrinal point. Luther, of course, believing Christ is truly present, Zwingli saying it's all just symbolic in the Lord's table. And so Philip gathers these, because if he can get Luther and Zwingli to agree, and all of those that follow Luther, all of those that follow Zwingli, if we can come to a doctrinal agreement, then we can form a military alliance and we can defend ourselves against any Catholic aggression. And so they meet at uh, this colloquy, at this discussion, uh, right from day one, it was pretty evident it wasn't going anywhere. Because Luther was not going to budge on his view on the Lord's Supper. In fact, and the opening presentation, he was asked to give the opening address. And Luther had the table he was at. It was a wooden table, and he had a, there was a tablecloth on it. And he had written in chalk in Latin the words, this is my body. And he was making the presentation. He jerks this tablecloth off and said, these words stand. This is where I stand. You know, these words um, it, it are not going to be taken away from us. So they had a discussion, and they came up with a theological document that had 15 points to it. And Luther and Zwingli, and the, the theologians who followed Luther, and the theologians who followed Zwingli, agreed on 14 of the 15 points of doctrine, uh, including on baptism and any number of other things. But they could not agree on the Lord's Supper. And so because they couldn't agree on 15 out of and there is no confessional agreement there can be no political alliance and so each protestant group is now left on its own to defend itself as best it can and so the meeting did not accomplish what a philip of hesse hoped it would accomplish one more thing from 1529 uh, just by way of passing reference is this was the year luther published his small catechism which we still use in confirmation to this day much to the dismay of confirmation students. Uh, Luther, what Luther had done is he'd visited the parishes in his province, in Saxony. And he was appalled that people didn't know much about the Bible at all. He was amazed. Something had to be done. And so he began work on two catechisms. There is, by the way, some of you may know, there is a large catechism. And there is a small catechism. The large catechism and the small are, are not related to each other in the sense that this isn't a condensation of the bigger one. They're two different works. This is one written for clergy in great detail. And it's, it's argumentative, proving points, giving arguments. The small catechism is written for the average layperson, just helping him or her to have a basic grasp of the Christian faith. And so that came out in the midst of all of these things in 1529. There's just one more historical event that I want to touch on before we turn to Luther as, as a person. And this comes from 1530. And 1530 is the date of the Augsburg Confession. 1530. Let me just tell you just a little bit about this. This is considered by, by a lot of historians to be the climax of, of the Luther story. So let me just skip along here. There's a slide here that I used for um, another presentation. Here's just a picture, a night shot of, of Augsburg. The Augsburg Confession is considered by some historians to be the climax of the Luther story. Even though Luther lived um, several years, a number of years past 1530. The story that began when he nailed up his 95 theses in 1517 comes to a climax in 1530. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Charles was, was still needing Lutheran support to fight the Turks. And so um, there was going to be the Diet this year, the Assembly this year. They kind of rotated German cities, as you can well uh, gather here. Uh, in 1530, it was going to be in the city of Augsburg. 
And uh, what Charles said, I want to discuss religious differences. We need to overcome these differences. We need to restore unity. And again, we have this issue of the Turks and the Muslims coming through Europe. We need to turn them back. And so the Diet convened uh, in in April of of 1530. And those were the two issues. The, The religious issue got on the agenda first. And what the request had been, before the the Lutheran theologians came to this meeting, um, the elector of Saxony, the prince under whom Luther and his colleagues lived, said to the theologians at the University of Wittenberg, you know, the emperor wants to know what our theological position is, and so I ask you to prepare a statement when we go to this meeting in 1530 that we can present our, our doctrinal stand. And so Luther and the other theologians worked on this document, Um, when when they got to the meeting, the thought was, you know, rather than each Lutheran territory saying, this is my statement of faith, this is mine, this is mine, this is mine, and you give the emperor 15 different ones from each Lutheran territory, what if we all got together and talked this thing through among all of us as Lutheran leaders and princes and come up with a common document? And so that is what they do. And, And what's interesting about the Augsburg Confession is the author of it is Luther as far as the content but the tone of it is that of his colleague, Philip Melanchthon. Philip Melanchthon was everything Luther wasn't. He was mild-mannered, he was quiet, on the one hand, on the other hand. That was the kind of guy he was, peaceful, not confrontive, and Luther later said he was glad Melanchthon wrote the confession rather than he, because it would have been filled with polemics and some pretty strong language. And so on the 25th of June... This is considered in Lutheran church history to be one of those fundamental red-letter dates. On June 25th, 1530, this combined a confession of faith was read before the entire assembly of the Holy Roman Empire. It was read in German. It took two hours to read it aloud. And, and the motto of the confession uh, came from Psalm 119, verse 46. I will speak of your testimonies before kings. And will not be ashamed and so so this for us if you look at our lutheran brethren statement of faith we say of the confessional statements that we hold the bible is our final authority for faith and practice these statements the following statements we believe express uh, some of the fundamentals of what the bible teaches we in our lutheran brethren statement of faith say there are five of them uh, the first three are the three uh, ecumenical creeds of the church the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed. Then we say the other two are Luther's Small Catechism and the Augsburg Confession. Um, This isn't the volume, but in my office, I have a collection of all the Lutheran confessions, which is about this size, maybe even a little bigger. I mean, so there's a lot more Lutheran confessions than these, but we as Lutheran brethren say the ancient creeds of the church, Luther's small catechism, and this first and foundational statement of faith is is sufficient to to really explain uh, what Lutheranism is all about. So this confession was made um, after the Lutherans presented it. Charles said to the Catholic theologians, I want you to reply to it. Give me an answer. So they put together a statement where they refuted supposedly everything the Augsburg Confession said, and Charles said, good, that settles it. Lutherans are wrong. The church has always been right. We throw out your statement of faith, and we reject your teaching and your theology. Well, without going through all the rest of the detail, after the Augsburg Confession, there were a number of wars in the German states between Catholics and and, and, and Lutherans. Sometimes the Lutherans have the upper hand, sometimes the Catholics have the upper hand, and it finally came to a conclusion in 1555, 25 years later, uh, in uh, an agreement called the Peace of Augsburg. And this is where, for the first time, in the Holy Roman Empire, it is legal to be a Lutheran. And so the idea of this peace treaty, finally, in 1555, is went back to the principle that had been enunciated some years earlier. Whatever religion the prince is, be it Lutheran or Catholic, it is now a legally recognized, tolerated religion. And if you don't like what your prince's religion is, you either have to conform or you have to move. Those are your two choices. And by the way, uh, of this great Holy Roman Empire, the only two choices you had was Lutheran and Catholic. You couldn't say, well, we want to be Mennonite. No, you can't be Mennonite. Well, I want to be a Calvinist. No, you can't be a Calvinist. 
The only two choices you had in this peace treaty was you're either Lutheran or you're Catholic or we as Lutherans and Catholics you know, persecute the rest of you. Those were the two choices. And so after a great deal of conflict, finally 1555, the Peace of Augsburg. Well, what, what I want to do is, is, is transition uh, to a little bit tonight on, on Luther as a person, um, a little bit about his personality, uh, his family life, some of those kinds of things. Uh, Luther, during the early years of his life, was a very thin, wiry man. He got married and he put on a lot of weight, is what happened to him. Um, but this is a picture of, of somewhere around 1523. Uh, Luther's probably, he's, not, he's probably 39 years old, uh, if, if it's in 1523, in, in this picture here. Um, very thin, very wiry. Uh, those that uh, knew Luther in his day, and you don't see it in the picture here, but everybody remarked on his unusual eyes. That he had eyes, everybody described them in various ways as penetrating, sparkling, fiery, burning, um, brilliant. Uh, people said it's like when he was looking at you, as he could look right through you, those kind of eyes. And of course the Catholics said, well that just shows those fiery eyes, shows the demonic stuff that's inside of him. That's why his eyes are so fiery, so burning, they said. Uh, Luther, uh, as far as his uh, voice was concerned, everybody said he kind of had a tenor voice. Um, very pleasing voice, an excellent singing voice, preaching voice. Um, he had a warm magnetic personality. In spite of all these harsh things he puts in print about Catholics and fanatics and you know, whoever all else, um, Luther was somebody that, that had, uh, he just would draw people, just had this kind of engaging uh, personality. He was immensely good-humored. Uh, he loved to joke around. He just, he just loved spending time with, with friends and colleagues. Uh, at the same time, he was about as stubborn as you'd ever find a person to be, stubborn as a mule. I mean, if he had an idea, eh, it wasn't going anywhere. This is the way it was. One of the things about Luther, um, this is a, a volume from uh, the American edition of Luther's works, uh, this is volume 54. This is only a partial printing of everything Luther wrote. Think, think of, uh, in, just in the English version, another 53 volumes this size. All of it written by hand, and there's much more besides. Um, Luther uh, had a phenomenal memory. And, and so he had at his disposal just a vast storehouse of knowledge and material so that when he wrote... Um, Luther never rewrote anything. Sometimes you know, like when we write things or I write things, you write it down, it's like you edit it and correct it and try the chapter again or whatever it is. Luther never rewrote. He seldom polished anything. He had this phenomenal storehouse of knowledge and information, memory, and he would just write. And that's why this tremendous volume of, of works. Uh, he had, had kind of a dramatic ability uh, in, in public and private. He, he sort of enjoyed uh, drama, um, you know, uh, games. Um, he loved music. We'll come back to that a little later. Uh, when he had the chance, he loved playing chess. Um, he was, a, he was a, just a, a brilliant uh, intellectual kind of individual, uh, but at the same time, he was somebody who loved good food, good drink, especially Wittenberg beer. That was good, and he would comment in his table talk, boy, the recipe Katie used this year was phenomenal, you know, that kind of thing. And, so, uh, and so, he was, uh, so he was a man who was, who was brilliant, intellectual, loved sitting around. Like he said, let the word do its work while me and my friends have a good you know, mug of Wittenberg beer. Um, an interesting, fascinating uh, individual. He was short of temper, um, especially later in life. Uh, p different people who were even his friends remarked on how he became increasingly short-tempered later in life. He was sick, um, and, and, and increasingly so as the years went by. Um, he was under a lot of stress and, and strain and tension. What we do know from descriptions, and he wouldn't have called it this, or his friends wouldn't have called it this, but to use modern medical terms, we surmise Luther had the following. Gout, insomnia, uh, hemorrhoids, uh, alternating bouts of diarrhea and constipation, which he struggled with for quite some time, kidney stones, ringing in the ears, and dizziness. So you think about, you know, kind of put all those things together. I got to read you this paragraph. 
Because Luther had kidney stones from time to time. This is a letter he wrote to his wife. If you ever had kidney stones, I remember once on a New Year's Eve, I was in uh, Trinity Hospital emergency room with Laurel, and you know, like, Happy New Year, I've got kidney stone. You know, that was, that was great. I remember that. Um, so anyway, so here's part of a letter to his wife. I just got to read you this paragraph. He says, I have not been well for three days, and for a time until tonight have not been able to void one single drop of water did not rest or sleep, and could not keep any drink or food in my stomach. All in all, I have been dead and have commended you together with the children to God, my good Lord, as though I would never see you again. If you've ever had kidney stones, you know, if you haven't died already, you wish you did. So I, you know, commended you, my wife, and all the kids to God, and he says, I felt sorry for you, but contented myself with the grave. That night, many friends prayed so hard for me to God that the tears of the people persuaded the Lord to open my bladder tract. And within two hours, I voided a large amount and felt as though I was born again. <laughs> uh, that's, if you've ever had kidney stones and you're finally relieved of it, yeah, you kind of understand what Luther's talking about, I think. That just gives you a little insight into his humor and his, and his personality. 1523 a group of nuns showed up in Wittenberg. They had escaped from their nunnery because they had been influenced by Luther and his teaching and writings, and it's like, you know, what we've been brought up to believe is wrong. We're trapped in this convent, and so they made their escape, and they arrive in Wittenberg. Well, what do you do? Okay, in those days, you have a single young lady, uh, uh, one who's been a nun all these years. You're not going to go out and get a job. I mean, you're pretty much in some pretty dire straits. And because they had left and escaped the convent because of what Luther had said and because of what he'd preached and written, he felt responsible for them. That's why they showed up in town. So it's like, okay, I, I need to find homes for all of them. I need to find wives for all of them. And uh, so he began to work on that. This is 1523. Uh, and uh, Luther, of course, didn't want to marry because of this being 1523, just two years earlier, the, the empire had decreed a death sentence on him. It's like, no, it wouldn't be fair to a, to a, to a woman to marry her and then be you know, burned to death as a heretic. So Luther expected death uh, could come at any time, and so he didn't want to get married. So you have these nine nuns that show up. Well, after two years, he had eight of the nine of them married off after working at it for two years. And there was one of the nine who just wouldn't uh, I mean, she wouldn't marry anybody. So Luther would say, how about this nice young pastor over here? Don't want to marry him. How about this one? Don't want to marry him. I mean, I, mean, she w I mean, he couldn't match her up with anybody. And so he said to her, finally, who do you want to marry then? You, she said. Um, her name was, by the way, let me just show you another. This is the more famous portrait of Luther after he's married and filled out a little bit from good home cooking. What's that? What was that? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's something we'll have to talk about. Um, but, but this nun, let me see, where did I put my, uh, my pen here? Here it is. Uh, the nun, her name was Catherine. Katie. Uh, Funbora. Um, let me just show you a, a portrait of her, painted by the official court portrait painter. This is uh, after she'd been married for about uh, four years. Um, there's, uh, there's Catherine. And uh, so she, she said, I want to marry you. And so he, he told his parents, he said, can you believe this? He thought it was a huge joke that you wanted, but she persisted. And so finally he decided to marry her, and he said, here are the three reasons why I'm going to get married. Listen to these three. Number one, to please my father, because dad had never wanted him to be a monk anyway. Number one, to please my father. Number two, I want to vex the Pope and the devil by doing this. And number three, I want to seal my witness before martyrdom. That for a clergyman to be married is in line with Scripture. I want to make that point. And so Luther and Catherine were married in, um, in June of 1525. There were 16 years difference between their ages, by the way. Luther was 42 and she was 26. And uh, they were married for, uh, for 21 years until Luther died. 
Uh, by the way, here, here's the significant thing. It's Martin Luther who established the Protestant parsonage. One of the great things he's remembered for. He is the one who established the home life of the evangelical clergy because in the Western church, the idea of a local parish pastor ever being married, that had not been done for over a thousand years. It was considered wrong against the will of God. And Luther says, yeah, but if you read scripture, it isn't. And so he is, because of his, when Luther took that step, he set the pattern and the tone and opened the door for pastors of churches now to be married. He is responsible for the married evangelical clergy. He's the one who established the Protestant parsonage. Well, Luther and, and Katie had six children, three boys, three girls. Uh, two of the girls died before they ever reached adulthood, which wouldn't have been surprising in that day. Uh, the three boys, I don't remember all their incomes, they, uh, their, 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 their occupations. They did grow to adulthood. One was a doctor, one was a lawyer of his three sons. I think the other did become a, a, a parish a pastor. And of course, when, when Luther got, uh, got married, there was a lot of hostility, a lot of criticism, gossip, slander on the part of uh, Luther's enemies. Um, and in accord with, with popular tradition of the day, popular tradition predicted that one day the union of a monk and a nun would produce Antichrist. And Erasmus, the humanist who never left the Catholic Church, was asked about that. I love his answer. Uh, he said, if that is so, if that is true, Antichrist must have been born thousands of times before this. So Luther, and, and Luther uh, as he talks about his, his marriage, it made many changes. He, he talks about how in the morning, all these years, you know, for 40-some years he'd been a monk and living alone. Now he wakes up in the morning and there's this female head with pigtails on the pillow next to him. He comments on that. That was kind of uh, unusual. That hadn't been part of his life. Uh, and another thing he was excited about, his bed was always made now because he never made his bed. Now all of a sudden he's married and, and Catherine makes the bed every day. So that was, that was thrilling. Um, he loved his wife, and, and he called her Lord Katie. Um, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, she, and, and she did run this household, this large household. She was an amazing lady. Um, something else he did, too, uh, you know, her name, Catherine, Katie. He liked to kind of make a pun on her name. There is a German noun, Ketta, which means chain. So he called her my Ketta, my chain, like the old ball and chain, I guess. Um, and it was all in, in, in good humor. Uh, he, he loved his wife with, with just, um, just a, a, an immense uh, heart. Um, the book of Galatians, which was Luther's far and away favorite book in the Bible, he called Galatians my Catherine von Bora. In other words, I love this book so much. Uh, it's just a beautiful way he, he described his love of Galatians. After he was married for about a year, this is what he, he wrote in a letter. He said, my Katie is in all things so obliging and pleasing to me that I would not exchange my poverty for the riches of Croesus. Croesus, an ancient monarch of Asia Minor who was fabled for having you know, gold every which way, just tremendously wealthy. I wouldn't trade my marriage for all the riches in the world. Uh, Luther was generous with money. If somebody had a need, uh, Luther would give to help meet the need. He made this statement one time. He said, I don't worry about debts because when Katie pays one, another comes, he said. So he didn't worry too much about money, bills. Uh, Katie would watch him like a hawk. Uh, there, there's a funny letter he wrote to a friend. He said, I'm sending you a vase as a wedding present. P.S. Katie's hidden it. Because he would just give away stuff from the house right and left. It's like, no, you're not giving the vase away. I don't know if he ever found it to mail it off as a wedding present. Uh, but he loved his wife very dearly. On one occasion, he began to worry, and he said, I give more credit to Catherine than to Christ who has done so much for me. But he just loved his wife just, just dearly. When his firstborn was, was um, rather young, Hans was his oldest son's name. Uh, let me read this statement again in a letter to a friend. Hans is cutting his teeth and beginning to make a joyous nuisance of himself. These are the joys of marriage of which the Pope is not worthy, he said. Um, at a later date, one of his other kids had colic and just cried. I mean, you couldn't get him to quiet down at night. And so Katie tried, Martin tried, 
Martin was at the end of his resources, Katie was at the end of her resources, and Luther said this is the sort of thing that caused the church fathers to vilify marriage. <laughs> I mean, the kid keeps you up. No wonder they were so negative on marriage, he said. Well, as far as where they lived, this was their house. It was the former cloister. Once the monastery was closed, the town of Wittenberg said, we got no more monks here, why don't you make this your house? So that was Luther's home and, and needed a large house because they had student boarders who lived in this place. They had taken in four orphan children, which they took care of in addition to their own. The household many times had as many as 25 people living there. And you talk about Katie needing to have things organized. Um, she did. Well, as Luther became world famous, and students would come over for the evening meal. I mentioned before, Luther would just say, hey, come on over for supper. You know, we already got 25 in the house. What's another eight of you? You know, whatever it is. And so the students would sit there at the table and they would take notes on everything Luther said because they knew he was going to go down in history as one of the greatest figures of all time. And so everything he said, every offhanded comment you can think of at the supper table, they jotted down and it irritated Katie. This isn't a time to take notes. If this is a lecture, you should be charging them. We could use the money, by the way. So this isn't a free lecture. But anyway, but Luther never did anything about it. Um, some 6,600 entries we have on every conceivable subject. And uh, let me just read a, a couple of comments out of this volume here is just a selection of his table talk. It's not all of it. Um, I like this one. I, he was talking one day about Noah and, and the ark at supper. And he said this, the ark of Noah was 300 L long, 50 wide, and 30 high. If it were not in scripture, I would not believe it. I would have died if I had been in the ark. It was dark, three times the size of my house, and full of animals. So that's just, what, just one, of one of Luther's comments there at the supper table. Here's another one. He liked to tell jokes. Here, here's one of his jokes. He said, uh, an officer in the Turkish war told his men that if they died in battle, they would sup with Christ in paradise. In the battle, the officer fled. When asked why he did not want to sup with Christ, he said he was fasting that day. <laughs> so a, a lot of interesting things. Uh, Luther's got some, some great comments on, on preaching in here. I'm, I, I've got a number of references. I'm just going to maybe read one, maybe two. Uh, comments on on preaching uh, let me see if i can find the first one here yeah here it is uh, luther said this in my preaching i take pains to treat a verse of scripture to stick to it and so to instruct the people that when they leave the service they can say that's what the sermon was about talk about an insightful comment uh, let me just read a politically incorrect one uh, let's see. This is a, a question that, that Katie asked about preaching and uh, Luther's comment. Um, when Katie said that she could understand the preaching of her husband's assistant, he gives the guy's name, better than that of Pomeranus, who was another colleague of Luther's. So when she went to church, she could understand this guy's preaching better than the other. Because the latter wandered too far from his subject, Luther responded, Pomeranus preaches the way you women usually talk. He says whatever comes to mind. Um, and, and he goes on to talk about how, you know, th this other preacher, everything, every thought that comes into his mind, he wanders here, there, and everywhere, and never really gets to his subject, never really sticks with it, but the politically incorrect part is he preaches the way you women usually talk. You wander from one subject to the other. Uh, there's all kinds of comments about, about preaching in his table talk. Well, Luther there at the table, he had his favorite mug. And um, the, the mug was, was cast, so it had three rings on the mug, and he had names for each of the three rings. The top ring was the Ten Commandments, and uh, the second ring was the Apostles' Creed, and the ring closer to the bottom of the mug was the Lord's Prayer. And he was very proud of the fact that you could have that thing full of good Wittenberg beer and he could drain it all in one gulp all the way down to the Lord's Prayer. That was Luther. He, he loved good food, good drink, friends, conversation. Uh, 
uh, something about, about uh, just, let me just mention a couple other things and, and we'll, we'll wrap it up for, for now. But for Luther, the, the pattern of, of work and responsibilities uh, with himself and Katie didn't always coincide. Um, when, when Luther would come home after a day of work, Katie had been with kids all day, her own kids, the servants, taking care of the animals, and she wanted to talk to an equal. Well, Luther had been preaching, he'd been teaching, conversing, with students, he just wanted to be quiet and drop in the chair and read a book. And so you have this little bit of, uh, of conflict. So Luther said this, all my life is patience. I have to have patience with the Pope, the heretics, my family, and Katie. And he commented on marriage. He said, think of Adam and Eve. They were married for 900 years. And he said, think of all the squabbles, he said, over 900 years, where Eve would say, Adam, you ate the apple. And then Adam would say, no, it's your fault. And that went on for 900 years in their marriage. 1538, this is from a, 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 a comment that Luther made. It must have been a bad day with some of the kids. He said, Christ said that we must become as little children to enter the kingdom of heaven. Dear God, this is too much. Have we got to become such idiots? Uh, on, on one occasion, uh, Luther's son disobeyed him, deliberately disobeyed him. Luther wouldn't talk to him for three days, and Katie had to plead with him to talk to him again because it's like, I want to show him the wrath of God against sin. <laughs> so there, there was, uh, so, but Katie's like, you, it's been three days, you can't do that. Let me just read you one letter, and we'll finish with this. This is a letter that Luther wrote to his little son Hans when Hans was four years old. Luther's away, it's at the time of the Augsburg Confession, there's negotiations going on, putting this great document, this great confession of faith together, and he has time to write a letter to his little four-year-old son. Just listen to this letter. He says, grace and peace in Christ, my dear little son. I hear with great pleasure that you are learning your lesson so well and praying so diligently. Continue to do so and do not cease doing it. When I come home, I will bring you a nice present from the fair. And every dad, when he goes out, like, you know, bring something for the kids when you come back. Luther was the same. He said, I know a beautiful garden where there are a great many children in fine little coats, and they go under the trees and gather beautiful apples and pears, cherries and plums. They sing and run about and are as happy as they can be. Sometimes they ride on nice little ponies with golden bridles and silver saddles. I asked the man whose garden it is, what little children are these? And he told me, they are little children who love to pray and learn and are good. Then I said, my dear sir, I have a little boy at home. His name is little Hans Luther. Would you let him come into the garden too to eat some of these nice apples and pears and ride on these fine little ponies and play with these children? The man said, if he loves to say his prayers and learn his lessons, and if he is a good boy, he may come. Lippus and Yost, those are two of his little playmates uh, also. And when they are all together, they can play upon the fife and drum and lute and all kinds of instruments and skip about and play with little crossbows. That doesn't sound real safe. He then showed me a beautiful mossy place in the middle of the garden for them to skip about in, with a great many golden fifes and drums and silver crossbows. The children had not yet had their dinner, and I could not wait to see them play. But I said to the man, My dear sir, I will go away and write all about it to my little son Hans and tell him to be fond of saying his prayers and learn well and to be good so that he may come into this garden. But he has a great aunt named Lena, whom he must bring along with him. The man said, very well, go right to him. Now, my dear little son, love your lessons and your prayers and tell your friends Philip and Yost to do so too, that you may all come to the garden. May God bless you. Give Aunt Lena my love and kiss her for me. Your dear father, Martin Luther, in the year 1530. 
So you think about all these things, you're writing against the peasants and you know, all these things and conflicts and he's in the midst of this Augsburg confession that's being written and he writes this kind of letter to his little son. That's the, so, so Luther is this multifaceted, just fascinating, fascinating individual. But what I want to do next time, I, I want to tell you the story of, of uh, the death of his daughter at the age of 13, which was a heart-rending story. And then I want to turn and just talk a little bit about Luther and music, just very briefly, uh, tell the story of his death, and then sort of uh, the so what of, uh, of the Reformation. So Lord willing, uh, next Sunday night we will finish with, uh, with all of that. So let me lead us in prayer, and then we'll stop for any, any questions or comments that you might have. Lord, um, it, it is amazing uh, when we understand uh, people in history, they're not one-dimensional cardboard cutouts. Um, but just like all of us, multifaceted in, in, in so many interesting ways. Now, Luther, very much the same. Uh, a man of courage and faith, a man who could write strong and harsh words that makes the hair stand up on the back of our necks. A, a dad who loved his little boy and wrote this beautiful letter to him. Um, an individual who loved his friends and sitting around talking, playing chess, all kinds of things that he enjoyed. What, what a beautiful, multifaceted person. Lord, you've made all of us that way. We're multifaceted as well. We have different interests and abilities and gifts. And there's not just one side to our lives. There's all kinds of sides that, that you have uh, created by, uh, by your will. So, Lord, help us to be the persons you've created us to be. And, Lord, uh, as we live our lives this week, above everything else, may Christ be glorified. We pray in his name.